This afternoon we wish to focus in the sermon on Lord's Day 27 and especially then on the infant baptism and in connection with that we wish to read two parts of scripture from Matthew, Matthew 19. Matthew 19 from 13 to 15 and then Matthew 21 verse 1 to 17. So first Matthew 19 verse 13 to 15 and there we read the word of God. Then children were brought to him, that is to Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven and he laid his hands on them and went away and he will continue reading at Matthew 21 verse 1 to 17 and there we read from verse 1 now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them, and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babes you have prepared praise? And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Thus far scripture reading. Now we'll turn to the catechism. Lord's Day 27. We'll read the whole Lord's Day and the focus will be mainly on Question and answer 74. It's page 541 in the Book of Praise. And there the questions are asked and answered. Does this outward washing with water itself wash away sins? No, only the blood of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit cleanse us from all sins. 
Why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins? God speaks in this way for a good reason. He wants to teach us that the blood and spirit of Christ remove our sins just as water takes away dirt from our body. But even more important, he wants to assure us by this divine pledge and sign that we are as truly cleansed from our sins spiritually as we are bodily washed with water. Should infants too be baptised? Yes, infants as well as adults belong to God's covenant and congregation. Through Christ's blood, the redemption from sin and the Holy Spirit who works faith are promised to them, no less than to adults. Therefore, by baptism, as sign of the covenant, they must be incorporated into the Christian church and distinguished from the children of unbelievers. This was done in the old covenant by circumcision, in place of which baptism was instituted in the new covenant. Let us sing after the sermon as response, hymn 29. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what is the position of the children in the church, also of the children that have just been baptised? God wants to involve them. He wants to ultimately to use them to voice his praise. In this regard, Psalm 8 is very striking. First, the glory of God is mentioned in that psalm. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. And immediately following those words, the children are mentioned out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When it comes to advancing God's glory the children seem to play a big role. They appear to be powerful tools to silence God's enemies. This afternoon I wish to preach to you on the position of the children of believers. And we'll consider three points. Firstly, the children of believers belong. Secondly, those children grow up with God's word. And thirdly, those children take God's word on their lips. So the position of the children of believers, those children belong, grow up with God's word and take God's word on their lips. Do children really belong to the congregation? Surely they can't contribute anything yet. Our babies can't even consciously think or believe. They can't yet serve the Lord. Should then they then be members of the church? Of the church of which we confess that is an assembly of true Christian believers? Should we not wait until they can come into action themselves? until they themselves can believe and consciously serve God? Yes, it's no problem for them to come to church. 
But surely those children can't really belong to the congregation. You recognise this reasoning? On the basis of this reasoning, many people reject infant baptism. In addition, they refer, often refer to texts that speak first of faith and then of baptism, like Mark 16, verse 16. Whoever believes and is baptised will be saved, in that order. Well, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus rejects this way of thinking. He does not wait until the children are grown up. Until they themselves can consciously believe or serve him. He pays attention to the children much earlier. He rebukes his disciples for holding those children back. They must allow those children to come to him. And Jesus takes them in his arms and he blesses them. He allows them to share in his fellowship and in his blessings. The Lord teaches his disciples and us an important lesson. Jesus embraces the children, includes them in his fellowship. He wants to give them his blessing, his covenant love. To those who do not seem to be ready for it yet, according to human standards. But beloved, surely to give your love and blessing to someone does not have to depend on the conscious response of that person, does it? As a parent, surely you don't first wait for the favourable response of your baby. Imagine these parents would do that. Wait till their baby can respond to them before they give them their love. No, you express your abundant love for your child before he or she can consciously do anything in return. The children belong completely. This is how Jesus approaches them. They belong, as God had already indicated, to Abraham. God wants to be a God to Abraham and to his children. And therefore in the Old Testament, they had to be circumcised as a sign of the covenant. They may share in God's love and fellowship. And that's why Jesus embraces the children and blesses them. The disciples are astonished when they see what Jesus does. He doesn't wait till people come to him at their own initiative. He doesn't wait till people can offer something to him. He takes the initiative and gives his love and blessing to the little children the parents bring to him. Yes, he gives his love and blessing to those who are not yet able to understand it or respond to it. Brothers and sisters, in your life with God, everything comes from God's side in the first place. That's how it starts. And therefore, baptism takes place at the beginning of your life with God. That's why baptism is also a one-sided sacrament. You are baptized. You don't baptize yourself. 
you are baptized. It gets done to you. At your baptism, you are passive. The Lord is the active party. He enters your life with his love and blessing. Everything comes from God's side. Thus, baptism shows the one-sided origin of the covenant. And therefore, we must stop relying on our own faith, building on our own achievements, on our own choices or commitment. They're always imperfect. They are only a fruit of God's prior action. The only thing you can do is hold on to God and expect everything from Him. Be like a little child. Realize your total dependence on grace. You have nothing to offer to God to win His favor. Your hands are empty, like the hands of those little children brought to Jesus, like the hands of these babies just baptized. And therefore, humble yourself before God. Accept His grace, His undeserved favor that He came to you before you could come to him. Beloved, in the history of the little children brought to Jesus, Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. In the gospel according to Mark, the words are added, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, shall not enter it. If you do not receive the kingdom like a child, without any pretensions, you will not enter it. Therefore, receive. Accept the kingdom as a gift of grace. And now the second point. The children of believers grow up with God's word. The Lord Jesus takes the children brought to him in his arms. He lays his hands on them and blesses them. They may share in his fellowship and receive the blessing of the covenant. Salvation is also for them. The promises of the gospel, God's grace and peace. Our catechism puts it this way. Through Christ's blood, the redemption from sins and the Holy Spirit who works faith are promised to them no less than to adults. But beloved, what is then so special about the children belonging to the covenant, this, that the triune God wishes to have fellowship with them and wishes to go with them through life with his word of grace and redemption. That word of redemption makes all the difference in their lives. That word distinguishes them from unbelievers. That word confirmed to them in their baptism. And after that, continually repeated to them. They may grow up with the word of life. While other children grow up without God and are left in their sin and misery, our children may grow up with God. 
their baptism as a sign of God's blessing in their lives. In it, they see and hear God calling them. Of themselves, they are dead in sin and guilt, subject to condemnation, living in darkness. But God intervened in their life. He calls them. He seeks their heart and life. And when God calls, then things change. Then darkness must disappear. Instead, you get the light. After all, God calls his children out of darkness into his wonderful light. He puts your life and the life of your children in the light. As he did with, did with the shepherds in the field. He places you in the light of his love and grace. In that way he renews your life. Death must retreat. God raises the dead through his word. When he speaks, then things come about as it was with the creation. He calls into being things that are not yet there. Sinners, enemies become dear children and heirs. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it is ultimately God's call that brings you into the covenant, into his fellowship. Not your birth from believing parents as such. No, it's God's powerful call that is decisive in your life. Just think of what Peter said on the day of Pentecost. For the promise is to you and to your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. God calls you through your birth from believing parents or through the hearing of the gospel at a later age. God puts you under the reach of his call and thus you as parents take your children along why? Because God wants to take them along. In fact, for you as parents, God is reaching out to your children. They are, after all, saints who are called by God. Yes, boys and girls, you are called to be saints. To be people who are set apart for God. And God keeps calling you. He already started with that at the beginning of your life. At your baptism. He spoke his word to you. Even though you could not understand it yet. He called you out of darkness to his wonderful light. And the darkness in which children without God live. He set you apart from the children of unbelievers. By the water he sprinkled on your forehead. A sign of redemption of the washing away of your sins through Christ's blood and spirit. And as you go through life with the sign and seal of redemption, and your parents lead you step by step on that path of redemption through their Christian upbringing, 
And in this way, God keeps calling you. And thus he goes with you through life with his living and powerful word by which the dead are made alive. The spiritually dead are made alive spiritually. So he seeks your heart and life to renew it. Beloved, that's why the Christian upbringing is so important. The last question of the baptismal form is not just there for the show. Remember the question? Do you promise to instruct your child in this doctrine as soon as he or she is able to understand it and to have him or her instructed therein to the utmost of your power? It is redemptive work. God makes use of us parents. He wants to use our mouths, our hands, to intervene in the lives of our, our children so that they may hear his good news, grow up with it, so that they may remain under his, the power and influence of his word. Yes, so that God may truly go with them through life. For if I, as a parent, do not take this instruction seriously, then I'll make the covenant meaningless. If I separate the baptism from the Christian upbringing, I separate that baptism from the claim that God has on our children. then my child would still grow up without God in the darkness. Such parents don't understand anything about the covenant and baptism. The living God does not usually enter the lives of our children in a mysterious way. Now he usually enters their lives through us as parents. Through us as parents, he wants to keep calling them with his gospel in order to renew them, to mold their lives, to save them. Those who are called to be saints must learn to understand their calling respond to it they must begin to live as saints as people set apart for god life in the covenant is not automatic god calls his children to himself indeed and he puts them on the path of redemption but as they grow up the children must themselves begin to walk along that path that's what the covenant's all about the covenant that started one-sided has to become two-sided but this doesn't happen just like that for that to happen the spirit is needed and the spirit works through christian upbringing and education only then can one truly say that God and man go together through life. Those called to be saints begin to live as saints. God's call receives a response. The response of faith. And that brings us to the third point. The children of believers take God's word on their lips. In Psalm 8, verse 2, we read, Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. The text even speaks of babies, children below three years. 
God establishes or prepares strength out of the mouths of infants and toddlers to silence the enemy and the avenger, to silence his enemies. Those little children are very valuable to God, valuable tools, able to silence the enemy. But beloved, how should we understand this? How can even the infants silence enemies? Well, what do you hear from the mouths of those children? Not just songs or prayers. The younger ones can't even do that yet. They can only utter inarticulate sounds or cry. Yet even those unintelligible sounds are like music in God's ears. Why? Because they come from his children. Those children already, already belong to him and his kingdom. God took them away from Satan to live with him. And Satan knows this. When he hears that baby cry, he's reminded of his defeat. As long as there are still, are still children of God, those children of the covenant, Satan is a loser. Those babies grow up. And then they start to sing and pray, Lord, Bless this food and drink in Jesus' name. Or time has come for me to sleep. And I thank you for your keep. Watch this night now over me. Teach me, Lord, to trust in thee. The children can't do this of themselves. Fire the believing parents. God works this in them. This way, God is training them as Christian soldiers. In this way, he's busy conquering his enemy. Those children sing psalms, spiritual songs. They say their prayers. They're instructed in God's word. At home. In the church. At school. At the catechism classes. At the Bible study clubs. Wherever. And when they consciously continue on that path, they become God's prophets priests and kings. They become Christian students, Christian workers, Christian businessmen or women. And thus God continues to have Christian soldiers and witnesses in this world, more than conquerors through him who called them. And that's why Satan hates it when he sees children being born to believers. That's why he shudders. When he hears the covenant children singing God's praises, he hates the occasions where children sing psalms and spiritual songs or recite scripture. Those children are too strong for him. He is the loser. When they praise and glorify God, Satan is silenced. God chooses what seems weak and insignificant to shame those proud enemies. And we see this happening, beloved, 
in the history of Matthew 21. Young children, what are they doing? They're singing the praises of God. Hosanna to the son of David. In the temple, Christ is busy healing the blind and the lame. The children see it and are amazed. And they remember the words of praise the crowd sang the day before when Jesus entered Jerusalem. They spontaneously begin to sing those words again. Hosanna to the son of David. Isn't this wonderful? The chief priests and scribes are furious. They also see Jesus' miracles. But they refuse to accept him as the Messiah. And they want the children silenced. But what does Jesus say? Have you never heard? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Jesus accepts the praise of those ordinary children, those street kids. It's music in his ears. Those children are the ones who have caught the truth. Whether they fully realize it or not, they are the ones who proclaim the truth. Proclaim it for everyone to hear. God's valuable witnesses who put the leaders of God's people to shame. And therefore, brothers and sisters, never underestimate the value of children in the church. God loves to see them here in his presence. He loves to hear them. They truly belong. They grow up with God's blessing, with his living and powerful word. And they often put adults to shame. Often they praise God where we out of shame or fear remain silent. Thank God for the children. Thank God for his work in and through them. They are vulgar, vulgar members of God's choir, his church.